My name is Christy Busby, and you are about to listen to the next episode of my podcast called Fate, from Atheism to Enlightenment. So come on in, join me. We're going to talk about it all, from Atheism to Enlightenment. Alrighty, guys, here we go. Get ready, and welcome to your fate. And we're rolling, guys. On today's episode of Fate, I have a very special guest. His name's Dave Schrader. If you are at all into the paranormal, you probably already know him from television, from his show on YouTube called The Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. He has a book out. He is all things spooky, paranormal, alien. He's done it. He is the perfect person to have the conversation we're going to have with today. Dave Schrader. Welcome to your fate, Dave. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks a lot for inviting me here. Oh, uh, thank you for taking the time. I can't even believe that you're, I can't even believe you're here. I'm, I'm very honored, by the way. My pleasure. When my friend Erica Frost says you should do this interview and I think you guys love a good conversation, that's all I need. I, I adore Erica and uh, I take her advice anytime. So I'm glad that we have a chance to connect here. I actually adore Erica as well. So we have that in common. (laughs) Very good. All right. Well, what I really wanted to talk to you about today, which is my Mm -hmm. my favorite topic of late, is the nature of our reality on this planet and what you think. I'd love to pick your brain on what you think that is. And um let, let's let's get it going. First off, why don't you, for those of you who don't know of Dave Schrader, which I can't believe there's anybody out there, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about your background? And I know you've been in the paranormal biz for 20 plus years. You have a vast, deep knowledge of uh, under your belt that I want to talk about today. So why don't you just tell your background, how you got into this, and sure. we'll go from there. Well, in real simple terms, I've just been surrounded by the supernatural my entire life. I had uh, ghostly visitations from my grandmother after she passed away when I was like two, three years old uh, to living in a haunted house in Medina, Illinois, seeing what I believe was a Bigfoot when I was about 12, 11 or 12 years old in Foley, Alabama on my grandparents' property Uh, and just kind of loving to experience all the strange and unusual. We can get so bogged down by life and the monotony of it all that I I feel like, you know, I want to take these moments to also examine the surprises that are still left out there for us to uncover. You know, as we become adults, we step away from the Christmas miracle feelings and Easter and birthdays and tooth fairies. And, and that kind of magic is then, you know, transposed down to our children and grandchildren, but there are still remarkable little gifts we can give ourselves and uh, opportunities to, see these special moments. So that's really what my focus has been for the last uh, 18 to 20 years here. I love that. As far as paranormal experiences, I know you probably have more stories that we would than we would ever be able to even tell on this one hour show we're going to do. But if you had to choose one or two that really impacted you in a way that you knew that there was life of some sort, some sort of consciousness, some sort of intelligence post well, that's a, this. That's a big get. I, I've had so many experiences with both inte- intelligent, residual, and fragmented, fractal versions of hauntings. I, I can't say what is the most impactful because every one has a different place in my heart, right? I mean, obviously, Having grown up knowing that my grandmother used to visit me, I have no conscious memory of that. I'm 53 years removed from that moment. But my parents would tell me about the experiences that I had. Uh, And just having, you know, having my grandmother, I think, show up at my oldest son's birth. He was born at home and we had a midwife who was helping to deliver. And my uh, uh, my little guy was in a lot of trouble um, because he was uh, breech. And so we tried every possible way. And then we had to use gravity as our friend. So I literally stood behind my girlfriend with my arms up like goalposts. She hung her arms over mine and she dropped her weight and push. And I just had major knee surgery the month before. 
So I was young, I was stronger, so it was all good. And she just got into a rhythm of saying, here comes another contraction. And then I'd lock down and bear down and she'd do the same and kick her legs up. And we were really trying to use gravity to get this baby out safely. And she came out of a huge contraction and I kind of relaxed and she dropped into another huge contraction and I tried to pull myself up and I ended up going backwards. And I, you know, I got to a crazy degree pitch and it felt like every muscle in my back locked up. What it really felt like was like hands grab me behind my shoulder blades and under my arms to lift me back up to a standing position. And my mom was a, a nurse at a hospital. She was there helping deliver the baby. She knows spinal cord injuries and knows what the spine is capable of. And what she saw, she said, was impossible. The fact that I was bent backwards and stood back up while holding a pregnant woman. So... um I firmly believe that my grandmother was truly there to help us uh, and had had made this visit because the room was filled with the scent of flowers during this, and uh, it hadn't been there before. And afterwards, I just did assume since we were at home, maybe somebody had knocked over some perfume or cologne, and that's what I was smelling. And after the the birthing process and the baby was safe, thank God, um, my mom goes, did you smell anything strange? And I said, mom, I was holding a pregnant woman, pushing a baby out of her. I smelled a lot of strange things. And she said, no, 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 like flowery. I go, yeah, it was really strong perfume. She goes, that was your grandmother's perfume. And then when I walked out into the living room, my aunt was there bawling like a baby because she got to witness the baby being born. And she's like, oh, it's so beautiful. Thank you for letting me be here. Did you smell anything weird <laughs> when, when the baby was being born? And she, too, agreed that it was my grandmother's perfume. So I feel like my grandmother was and has made herself known to us throughout different elements of our life. Wow. That is that's pretty incredible. Yeah. So that that's neat. Those are the moments. And I really do feel close and akin to my family. My mom, I lost my mom, um, gosh, what, seven years ago, eight years ago now. And I have been of the mind that I try, I don't want to call upon her. I, You know, mom lived a great life. She was a nurse. She helped take people and take care of people and heal them. And she died of cancer, which took her very quickly. And I just, I just felt like, you know, we had such a great loving relationship in life that I don't need to call upon her in the afterlife. But there was one time I had uh, been on a cruise and I had a little crucifix that I would wear because mom loved to travel and it was filled with her ashes. And I lost it while I was on the cruise mm -hmm. and I was shattered by it. And I was just sitting at home one day and I, I opened up Facebook and saw a memory for my mom. So I wrote my mom a message on Facebook of all things. And I just said, I miss you. I love you. I, you know, I hope wherever you are, you're happy. And if you could just give me any kind of sign that you're still near, that would be great. And, uh, the next day my, my son was, couldn't find his glasses anywhere. And, uh, he was a little guy, a little pair of glasses, but we couldn't find them. And I asked everybody to look. Nobody bothered until I threw like a $10 reward up for it. And then kids scattered like cockroaches looking for the glasses. And one of my sons came up to me and he had this little clay jar I have. It's an Egyptian clay jar of life. And he goes, Dad, look what I found. And he lifted the lid off and there was my mom's crucifix. No chain, just the crucifix uh, with her ashes in it. And I was like, how did how did this happen? You know, I mean, and then it hit me like a ton of bricks. Just yesterday, I asked my mom for a sign, any kind of sign, and we were reunited. Um, so I had that happen. And then while I was filming the TV show, The Ghosts of Devil's Perch, we were filming a really busy day. And when I got back, I realized my necklace was gone. I'm like, man, I was running around and carrying backpacks and things and I don't know where it would have fallen off. So I, I messaged a director and I'm like, I'm really kind of heartbroken by this. So he searched and like, it was like, two o'clock in the morning, he's out walking the streets we had been filming on, looking for silvery glints on the sidewalks. He could, came back and he goes, Dave, I looked everywhere. I went to all of the spots we filmed at today. I'll check the van again tomorrow. And then I was just like, okay, thanks for trying. And I looked up and I said, all right, mom, I'm going to need your help finding that crucifix again. And about 10 minutes later, my director called and he goes, uh, I found it. It was under my bed. What? Yeah. Yeah. So somehow ended up at our headquarters in his room under his bed. It's funny, the guy I called, and I just so we're clear, I wasn't sleeping with my director. Uh, there was no intimacy between me and Brian Peterson, uh, and I'm sticking to that story, and I hope he does too. But uh, yeah, the crucifix showed up again. So that's two times chills. That, that, from yeah. yeah. That is. So those are, those are kind of cool moments. That's it. 
pretty huge uh, sign that something, it's something that's going on for sure. Right, right. I'm, um, I've been watching you a little bit and I've noticed that you, you've started, and I don't know if this is a new thing or something that you, a running thread that you've been doing within your, your, um, your platforms, but you have started kind of talking a, a little bit more about spirituality. And like, I, I loved your podcast with like Lisa Williams, um, and Judy, um, you know, and you, you're starting to talk about things that, that are, paranormal but they are also deeply um spiritual and they talk more Mm -hmm. about instead of the the spooky of it all the more magic the more frequency the more vibration of what our reality probably more than likely is Mm -hmm. in 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 detail really when you get down to it did you have you been a spiritual person you're life have or are you more religious do you do you do you find that your paranormal investigations changed your views on what religion is and in what our reality is or what are your thoughts as far as that it's a lot to unpack i uh here here's the thing i grew up christian Mm -hmm. i still consider myself to be christian i'm not an avid church goer as i don't i have i have a lot of issues with the people in charge of the churches. Um, a lot of the uh, hypocrisy. Uh, you know, at one time I was in church and I really had a lot of respect for this pastor. He spoke to us like friends instead of from the pulpit of fire and brimstone. And I'd really, I'd taken the most from him than I think I'd ever taken from any pastor and just was able to absorb the words and, and you know, the, the lessons and then one day he just went on a tirade about homosexuality and just started shredding homosexuals. And uh, half the congregation got up and walked out. And I, I just sat there wondering, is there some punchline coming? Is there something that he's going to show us a lesson? The lesson was hatred. The lesson was intolerance. The lesson was not learning at all what the word of God meant. And that was the last time I went to church. Um, uh, you know, I, I visited again shortly after 9-11 because like everyone else, I wanted, I just wanted to feel connected to something bigger again. And I went into churches and the two or three churches I visited were bustling. They were at capacity because so many people had turned back into church seeking God's wisdom and, and help for understanding what we were going through. And you know, the churches. And again, I, I'm not attacking organized religion. I'm just telling you what my experience was. They were so focused on, wow, we've got more people than we've ever had. Let's talk about tithing and why you should give more money to the church. And it was less about giving us a sense of peace. It was less about sharing God's word as it was more about the punishment if we're not taking care of our churches. And I felt like you've missed a great opportunity here to turn people back to religion, back to this. And I think it's because their training is not there for that. They're, they're taught a different way. Um, that's why so many religious leaders are not prepared to help when we start dealing with malevolent hauntings or possible demonic I- interactions. They're just not adept to that. They're not trained for that. They know about it. They know it exists. But when it comes to the reality of now I have to face it, a lot of them won't do that. And it's, it's kind of heartbreaking. So I, I'm spiritual in nature. I feel shielded in most of what I do. Um, I also battle depression and anxiety. And I know that, you know, that there's elements of darkness that pull at that, that, you know, want you to fail. But I also realize that I've been put in a really unique position throughout my life. Uh, and, and I try not to, I try not to just dismiss that. I, I realize that. Not trying to sound self-important, but, you know, I've been given an opportunity to live and hopefully share insights with people that may make them rethink their situations. And I I know that a lot of those words and those moments come from somewhere else Mm -hmm. and that I am nothing more than a channel for that. And, and, uh, you know, I appreciate God and giving me that gift to share with others. Um, so it's kind of a mixture, but in a lot of what I've done, it's always dealt with the spirituality of the moment and showing empathy and love. 
listen, like many people, when ghost hunters started and all these, I was just more interested in the thrill of let's go see a ghost. Let's. But then as I did it more and more and I started to see the way people treated spirits, I thought, who would, you're demanding the spirit speak to you. If I was sitting here and somebody burst in my front door and just started, what's your name? Why are you here? I wouldn't answer. I'd just sit here stunned. So I think that showing compassion and empathy and love and respect for these spirits, realizing that what we may consider frightening is nothing more than a spirit lashing out that wants to be heard. They may not realize the impact they're having on us when they do something that we think of as terrifying or frightening, if that makes sense. So I've, I've really tried to just adhere to moments of uh, compassion, empathy, and love when it comes to uh, coming into contact with these spirits. And then I try to do a closing prayer at every location I go to, to turn the light on so that, you know, not that I believe God leaves spirits behind, but I believe that, that God energy, the universe works together when people come together and in asking for peace for these spirits, asking for them to find enlightenment and move on to wherever the next level is. That's important to me. And now my, my outlook on what God it is has changed tremendously, but I also believe that God is um, a different name to many different people. And, you know, I, that's why I don't have problems with you know, if people want to pray in their their belief system, if people want to uh, believe in what they believe, God love you. If the if the case is that, just do good, be good, show kindness and compassion, then we're all on the same train. It doesn't matter whether we call him God or Yahweh or Buddha or Allah or Donny Osmond. Whatever fits <laughs> is uh, hey, Donny. I've mentioned you. I'm not fooled by you. I know who you are, but uh, I just. You know, a lot of this is all about personal experience and and knowing that when we call upon a greater good to help, things change. And it just so happens that I call that greater good God. I do think it is all about compassion, love. It It is. It, it, the more mm -hmm. we tap into our own humanity and being able to see ourselves and others and it's, mm -hmm. it is is the direction that humanity should be going in. And unfortunately, it's, it's a very, it's kind of a dystopian where we're heading into this kind of weird, strange, the consciousness on the planet I feel is filled with an, an absorbent amount of negativity, of fear, mm -hmm. of anger. And it is show, I think it, a little bit about me. I, I was never religious growing up. I, I grew up, I was an atheist. I was very into science. I have a degree in animal behavior and neurobiology. I believed in evolution. I believed in the scientific method. And I believed if you can't see, touch, or taste it, it doesn't exist. And that includes God, religion, whatever you want to say. And it was only through um, a severe health crisis where I started having to turn to alternative ways to heal myself that... Mm -hmm. I started walking into the world of spirituality, of getting into energy healing, of doing plant medicine journeys, of, of starting to have my own practice of meditating, of looking within and figuring out that we are much more than we think we are. And I'm under the impression currently that if more people knew that they had the ability to change their outer world by changing their inner world, that we would maybe be able to have a, uh, a positive impact on the planet if people took the frame of mind that if uh, I personally think our reality works such like this, whatever you're resonating with vibrationally, if you're resonating with shame, guilt, fear, unworthiness, anger, jealousy, that is what the reflection of the universe is going to show you. If you're going to resonate with higher vibrational frequencies, love, joy, gratitude, uh, empathy, kindness, peace, I believe that that will also be showing up in your reality. And I think that our belief systems and what we believe, if, if you believe that all men are bad, you're going to have a lot of negative interactions with men. If you believe 
that people are out to get you. You're going to have that show up in your reality. And I think that our belief systems are a representation of kind of what happens in our world. We are almost co-creating our own realities by what we're resonating and vibrating with. That is what the universe is going to attract for you. And Mm -hmm. for me, through my experience of healing myself and, and walking in this world, and it's new, it's all very new to me and I'm still figuring it out. And I haven't necessarily gone back to church yet, but I do believe that there is a higher universal power. You can call him God, mm-hmm. Yahweh, whatever you want to call call him. I believe that he is all loving and he wants, he is a loving, high vibrational, I don't even know what to say, uh, energy of sorts, I guess you could say. I don't think it's of a human, like, I think it is more of an energy. I believe that it is much more about energy and frequency than it is about materialism as far as our experiences go here. And I'm wondering, one of the reasons why I'm doing this show is because I do want to start talking to people about taking back their own power a little bit and giving them hope that if they were to change their inner world a little bit, that it could very well change their outer world. What do you think about that? Oh, I firmly believe that. You know, here's the thing, though. It's an interesting way. Uh, Most of what I know is about perspective, right? I don't think that just because you're focused on negativity, it draws negative to you. Or if you think on positivity, it draws. I think that all is around us at all times. But it becomes a mnemonic trigger. It's like when you buy a little yellow VW bug, you nobody's driving these anymore. The last I saw these were the 70s or the 80s. And now you drive it. And within a week, you've seen a thousand little yellow bugs. And you're like, what the hell? Where did these all come from? They've been there. You just haven't been as acutely keen and aware of them because your brain was focused on other things. But now that you're recognizing the patterns, you start recognizing the totality of what these little quote unquote signs are. It's all there for us. It's every every piece of it is going on around us. And I watch people that are overwhelmed by negativity and listen, I face it all the time, but the fact is I still find a way, right? There's a way to keep moving through the muck and mire. And sometimes it's cutting people out of your life. And sometimes it's, it's stepping beyond your comfort zone. And that's when real growth happens. And I think that we, we don't give ourselves enough credit for just how remarkable we are. Okay. And if we, If we step outside that comfort zone, and right now I'm going to address all the people watching that are saying I'm in a miserable position, I cannot get out, then that's where you will stay. If you start opening your eyes and seeing the ways out and realizing that you're more than the set of circumstances you're a part of, you'll start to see that your life has options and opportunities. But the problem is when you're looking through a pinhole at how bleak everything else is, it's time to start spreading that pinhole out so you have a bigger perspective on things. Um, We're all going to be influenced by negativity. And like you said, it comes within. You have to make the adjustments within yourself. And sometimes it's cutting people out of your life that you love very much, but you just know they're a toxic trait. And it's like saying, hey, I don't like cocaine, but I really love the smell of it. Well, right? The joke is that that's how you absorb cocaine. The problem that we have then is you have to start to discern, if I do this, the destructive nature follows. So you don't have to call upon God. You don't have to call upon a higher power. You just have to step over the bodies. You have to start stepping over the things that are in front of you. And there are some really great little uh, takes on things. You know, it's why does God keep putting difficult people in my way? Maybe he's not. Maybe he's putting you in their way so that they can see you and learn by example that you're the positivity this person needed. So you can focus on the weight that you, you're you carrying with these people, or you can focus on the light that is shining on you to lead them out of the darkness and help them as best you can. And if you get to a point where it is suffocating to you, it's not a failure to step away. You, you can only do so much. God 
the universe energy can only do so much. If you're not open to it, you're not going to move forward any further. None of us really want to get out of bed and go to work. None of us really want to do the things that are not fun. But the fact is that you have to do those things in order to get the things that you want to do. And that once you start that, you start to realize that things work in a cyclical manner and you can actually start to see yourself elevating and getting out of these places. So I know it's tough when you're in the wallows, when you're down there with the muck and mire and the shit water slapping you in the face and you're thinking, I'm going to drown. But, you know, even like they say with quicksand, if you relax, you stop sinking. Yeah. You know, yes. and then you find the way to pull yourself out. It's it's in, okay, this is my situation. This is a temporary situation. Um, and then finding a way to lift yourself back out of that and and get into it. And I think that we are so connected as a species and to so many different things that in opening our minds up and instead of allowing the convolution of negativity and the outside influences of negativity to weigh on you all the time, if you just start opening yourself up and saying things like, all right, Donny Osmond, all right, God, all right, Allah, Buddha, whoever you are, I'm listening. Help me find a better way. Say that before bed. Go to sleep and see if your brain doesn't start figuring out a way or get messages in a way that will help you get past where you're at. I have achieved a life I should not have achieved through the eyes of most people. And I've been able to do and see things. But you know what? Ever since I was a little kid, I used to practice signing my autograph for the time I'd be on TV and do radio. And I used to create my own little radio shows in my garage with a black tape recorder. So I willed into life the life I wanted to lead. But the lesson in that to me was it didn't happen when I was 12. It didn't happen when I was 22. It happened when I was 40. So it took a while to get there, but I never let go of that dream. And the concept of, boy, I'd really love to get back into radio after college. Boy, I'd really like these opportunities. And if you stay awake and pay attention, you'll see the doorways open. And so much of us are, oh, but I don't want to be a, I don't want to step through it because what if somebody else? And, you know, I don't, you, you have to just start realizing that when an opportunity shows itself to you, you, you need to step through that, that chasm and accept the reality that is being given. If you step back and you're always the nice one and, oh, no, everybody else go first and that's okay. You know, how many times is God going to send that boat to pick you up during the flood, yeah. right? And yep. at some point, you're going to go under. So you have to be the one to step through that door and just accept, okay, this is my opportunity. And I think more people need to focus on that. And, I, you know, I think that's what's made me successful in the world of the paranormal is the fact that I, I just see it. This is where I belong. This is the world I belong in. Sometimes it's real hard to see because there's no money in reality TV. I'm not being rich from doing that. There's obviously no money in podcasting. I'm not rich from doing it, but I'm rich in a different way, spiritually and uh, with a reach that I never expected to have, that I'm able to uh, communicate with others and hear their stories and share and relate their stories to others who felt like they were broken because they've had experiences that nobody else they know has had. Well, now they know they're not alone because I brought forth people that have had those experiences. So I, I am very much a conduit to, to doing what I want to do because I leave myself open to it and allowing things to work through me and accepting of those good things. And then even looking at what is the, this is bad, but what good can come from this? What can I do to say, all right, this was a sh lesson to learn. But now I know not to put myself in that position again. And sometimes it takes a lot of hand slapping because yeah. you keep trying to, but I hope this one's different and I can, okay, okay. <laughs> but that doesn't mean you turn yourself off to everything, right? It means that you just become more cautious and aware and, and watch the calculated steps you take to help people. It's living more consciously, don't you think? I feel like there is just this world of people that are that are reacting from a, one emotion to another emotion without actually thinking there's no thought ba behind it whether you're scrolling on a phone and you're just going i hate that this this or or you are you stuck in traffic and you're aggravated it is not being conscious of the emotions that you're having from one moment to the next you're just having them and that energy is going to affect you it's going to affect you negatively or positively and the one thing that i have learned through my health experience is that i am living much more consciously i am aware of the emotions that i'm having and i am trying 
very hard. It's not easy. You, it is, it's an old habit that I've had where you're just reacting to whatever is happening around you, good or bad. And instead, I'm trying very hard to be conscious of what I'm saying, what I'm speaking, the words that are coming out of my mouth. I do believe that there is something to the words we speak. It is putting energy in the world. You are spelling, you are speaking. You, for instance, I believe was setting intentions even when you were very young. You were manifesting, you were, you were setting the intention of what you wanted to see in your own world. And Everything happens on God's time, I guess you could say. And it might have taken you some twists and turns to get there, but you were still manifesting your future just by thinking in that way and setting those intentions. It does impact your outer world. And, and for me, it's given me a lot of peace and a lot of, um, less fear. I think that one of the hardest things to overcome in humanity is that we really do have a terrible amount of fear within us, fear of everything, fear of change, fear of anything that's different than us. Uh, it is part of our biological, you know, fight or flight kind of thing that we have to deal with. It, it's, an, it's a hard thing to overcome, but I have been very cognizant of trying to figure my emotional Every day I get up and I set my intentions and I try very hard to overcome those instances where I want to have a meltdown. I stop, I pause, I breathe and I reset so I can manifest good. So I can have positive things show up in my outer world. I'm, it's, I'm trying to fix my inner world and it's hard. But it's also about, um, giving up expectations. Mm -hmm. Giving up what, okay, I want a sign. God, you need to give me a sign. Show me him a way out of this. And what we, what you're really saying is, God, I need you to walk through the door and hold my hand through this next juncture. And you don't get that. But what happens is somebody at work quits and suddenly the job opening is there. Well, I'm never going to get it. But it's interesting that opportunity came when you asked for an opportunity to get you to the next level. It's your uncertainty that, that your fear of failure or rejection or like I deal with, I deal with uh, um, this imposter syndrome. You, you just, hey, listen, I deal with that all the time, but here I am. I've been on TV. I've been on radio. I've written books. It, it, the imposter syndrome, I won't let it beat me. I let it have its place once in a while, um, but I also learn from those moments. And well, I, and then I start thinking, this might be the moment I have to push the hardest because if something is trying to shut me down, that must mean I'm real close to doing something great. I'm real close to getting into that next level. Something doesn't want me there. The negativity, the darkness, the demon realm, whatever you want to call it, that is our own personal demons pulling it down. Are you going to give into that or are you going to step out of that shadow and say, cool, let's do it anyway. Yeah. Let's do it anyway. And and find that way to to move. And the the main problem that we have as a race is the fact that we want everybody to love and accept us. And then we put up this shield of, I don't care if you like me at all when we do. And instead of finding ways to make ourselves more appealing, and I don't mean that sexually or physically, but I mean, to, to realize how, yeah, how do I want to put this? Let's talk about the sexual and appealing side of it, right? How many people do you know that you look at that couple and you're like, why is he with her or why is she with him? And you think, boy, they could do so much better. And then you realize that they have this love that sees beyond the physicality of the moment. And how many people have you been friends with or just been near? And then as you get to know them in their soul, you realize how attractive they are. And you're like, why did I not notice that about this person before? And then on the flip side, how many people have you been drawn to because of the outer shell? And the more you get to know them, the more you realize this person is garbage. They are so broken and not willing to be kind or show empathy. And suddenly you look at them from a different perspective and you're like, how did I ever look at that person and think that person was attractive? They are so cruel and mean, right? So it goes beyond looking at the physicality of who a person is. It's truly in getting to know someone and being open to accepting that person in your life that we start to find that the real gifts are there, that those are the moments that we are meant to have. Um, 
it, we've been, all of us have been confused. Listen, I have a great chocolate cake on the counter. It's a three layered chocolate cake. And man, for immediacy, I'm going to be real happy. In the long run, I'm going to look at myself and go, yeah, you needed that cake, dummy. Why did you do that to yourself? Why did you eat that cake? But right now I wanted it. It felt so good. But in the end, I see what the result's going to be. So I'll just have a little piece and then I'll make sure everybody else in my family gets a little piece and that'll be good enough for me. I, I sated that need and desire. Yeah. And now I don't have to go any further with it. And, and we can all start to do that by just taking stock in our moment, enjoying the little things and making sure that the rest of the world gets to enjoy those little things with us. But don't over, overdo it. Don't glut on any of those moments. Share the wealth of love, knowledge, empathy, compassion. And that, I think, is, is a huge lesson people can take. And I think that those are the chains, right? I, when you, you read Charles Dickens and you read the Christmas Carol, right? Jacob Marley, his dearest friend, comes to him bound in chains. And he says, these are the chains that I forged in life, Ebenezer. Each link is every crappy thing I've ever done every horrible thing. And now I am weighted to eternity with this. But you have a chance to break those chains. You have a chance to snap them and make a better tomorrow. My full belief is heaven and hell are going to be exactly what I expect it to be. My heaven and my hell, and I'm going to experience both, no doubt in my mind, but I'm doing my best to make sure that my hell is a much shorter experience. My hell is going to be revisiting every moment I've hurt somebody. Every moment I made the conscious decision. Conscious. There are things sometimes we do or say that we don't realize are hurting people because they're just overly sensitive to that. Right. But when you consciously make a decision to hurt someone, I think you're going to relive that moment, not just through your eyes, but through the eyes of that person. And then you're going to have to see how that plays out for that person and feel every emotion and every moment of panic and Fear that they felt as a repercussion from that moment. I think that's hell. And I think heaven is the opposite. I think that I'm going to feel all of the good things and the positive influences that I've had, but I'm going to have to go through hell to get through heaven. And that's what's going to come. So I would much rather shorten that hell journey and lengthen the heaven. I agree. Than be bound with all those heavy chains of just all I'm worried about is Dave. I agree. It's interesting you say that because one of my big fascinations is listening to people tell their near-death experiences and what has happened to them and what they see and what they experience. And then they come back transformed completely. Mm -hmm. And one of the running threads that I've heard people talk about is this life review that happens when you pass and that you do end up having uh, to go through and see where you have wronged somebody and you do end up feeling that emotion that you projected or you made somebody else feel due, due to your behavior. And I, what are your thoughts on people's near death experiences? What have you, have you, um, do you have any experience with anyone that has had any of these? Oh, sure. Right. Yeah. Of course. And, and you know what I think is an interesting tell is many of us have a near-death experience every night when we go to bed and our brain won't shut off. And we sit there thinking about, oh, I should have said this. I should have done that. That is a near-death experience because you look at all the things you robbed yourself of, of the joy that day, or how you should have probably just stepped away from that moment as opposed to engaging it or flaring it up. Um, and I think that you know sometimes it's important for us to, at the end of the day, lay there and reflect. Reflect on the the positive and the negative. What are the things today that, well, I probably shouldn't have eaten the entire cake. It was so good. It was so good. I shouldn't have eaten that whole cake. And I'm going to feel some resentment towards having done that, but that's okay. I acknowledge that. But you know, what did I do today? I did. I finally got out and cleaned out that garage and I'm donating all these things to people that are now going to be able to use those items. That's a good thing. I'm given back and I'm trying to make a difference and I'm trying to change the way that my day went. And I think you just start taking the wins, accepting the good things that you do and build on those every day. And it doesn't mean ignore the bad, acknowledge the bad, acknowledge what you've done that was without thought or care. And then maybe tomorrow you make that call, right? And you go, hey, listen, I realize what I did. I'm sorry. I, I was not that this is an excuse. I've been dealing with a migraine for three days. I'm exhausted. My brain's just not thinking properly, but that's no excuse to treat you that way. 
So please accept my apology and I'm going to do my best to not see that. Or I'll be very open with you and say, I've got a bad headache and I'm having a real hard time. So I'm probably not the best person to talk to right now. So then that way you're taking in the other person's account. You're, you're doing these things and that's a, that's a move to the positive. And then on the other side of it, look at all the good that you did today. And, and you don't need the accolades. I actually feel better when I don't get patted on the back for something I did, because then I kind of feel like, did I do that for the right reasons? Did I do it because it was right because of that? Or did I do it because I knew you were watching me do it? Right. We're, we're judged, I think, much heavier on the things that we do that nobody notices. And although we all like to take credit and we all want people to acknowledge that, uh, well, Dave ran into that burning building and helped save those children. Uh, the fact of the matter is it should just be done. We should just care enough about one another to do those things, whether you acknowledge who I am or not, or anybody else does. And those are those are learning lessons and moments that, you know, many of us need to take. And I'm still learning. I'm 56 years old. Every day is a new learning lesson. And I sit back, you know, today I, I just, I, I reached out to my kids on social media in a group message and just told them how much I love them and appreciate them and how much I respect who they are. And, you know, my son's response is, are you on your deathbed? You know, it shouldn't come to that. It shouldn't be the point that people wonder if you're dying because you're being kind and sharing what's in your mind. We should open our hearts more often to one another to let them know how important they are to us and not have it be a shock when you hear good things, right? Or, or experience those moments. So that's a learning lesson for me today. Um, you know, that, that's something that I can take away. I do think that. There is less of a connection between humans in general. There is a lack of um, ability to be kind these days. I feel like it is so hard to get people to not judge, not be vile to each other. There's so much animosity, anger. It's weird. Because we're rewarded for that now. Yeah. Online, I go on and I mock people and then people will tune into my TikToks or my videos because, well, this guy's just a jackass. Oh my God, can you believe he said that? And that's endorphin highs. From, look at how many people and they're spreading my, so you can hate me all you want. I have 400,000 views of that video, but I told you, and you know what? That taught me a valuable lesson. Me saying that got me so much more attention. And the important thing is nobody holds us accountable anymore. Yeah. Nobody takes us and puts us in the corner and goes, you don't do that. You don't say that to people. You don't talk to people that way. You know, Mike Tyson has that great line that what people have forgotten due to social media is what it feels like to get punched in the mouth yeah. for saying something stupid. Yeah. And the fact that we used to be accountable and oh, well, so you're advocating for bullying. Yes. I really feel parents need to bully their kids again. I feel that there's elements of that and not in the way that you think, but we have to hold each other accountable. You know, by bullying is, and I use that term so loosely, by bullying those people in our lives, it reminds them there are repercussions for your actions. Yes. And everybody wants to be everybody's best friend or completely hate you. There's no middle ground for most people. And the fact is you... You know, we need to hold each other accountable. We need to hold each other to a higher expectation. And if you just accept that this guy's a jackwad and he's going to say racial, hateful, gay slurs, our church spoke. My pastor started beating up on homosexuality. Half the church got up and never went back. That spoke volumes. Sadly to him, from people that I know that stayed, he said, well, good. Our church doesn't need those people. And who did Jesus preach to? Jesus didn't hang out with the clergy. Jesus hung out with the hookers and the tax That's collectors right. because they needed the most. They were the ones that needed love and compassion the most because everybody else had dismissed them. And had our pastor stepped forward and said that homosexuality, according to the Bible, is not righteous. But the most important lesson is that we should love everybody yes. and that we should accept people for who they are and that whether I believe it's a sickness or a choice, that's your life to lead. Just know that I am here to share God's word with you and, and do this. That's an empathetic approach yes. to being 
a leader and showing that you can lead without hatred, without anger, without resentment. And those are those are lessons that we all need to take. But absolutely, again, I, I'm a firm believer. I had a healthy fear of my dad. I did not do a lot of things because I was more afraid my dad was going to kick my ass than anybody else. And um, there's just we've lost that feeling of oh, there's other people above me, and I do need to be respectful if I hope to get anywhere. Well, I don't need to. And I, I hate when I hear my kids say that because then I'm like, oh, man, you're in for an ass kicking because, hey, you treat somebody like this at work, you're fired. Well, I'll just find another job. I got to tell you something. There's jerks at every job. That's right. And mostly they're bosses. So you can hate on every. You can't just keep getting a job every week because you don't like the boss. Yeah. You're never going to like the boss. But what you do is you go in and you work and you work hard and you become the boss. And then you treat your employees with empathy and compassion and love, and they will follow you into the sun, right? And that's what needs to be done. And those are lessons that a lot of people are not feeling or hearing anymore, is that we do need to have that. And that's, I think, where religion went off track. Religion and the Bible is a book of parables to teach us right from wrong. That's right. It's to show you that when you do these things, that there is a cost. And even when you stand up for God, there's a cost. You're thrown into the lion's den. But if you go into that lion's den, assured, head up and do the right job, sometimes you can win them over. You can show them that in your stoic nature and in this kindness, again, the lions are not true lions. They are the people that are around us every day. And when you can show that you constantly rise above the negativity that they throw out there, you will start to erode them. They will start to change because they'll realize, oh, it's not just an act. This guy is who this guy is, and he's going to be kind no matter what kind of crap I throw their way. And I think that's an important element of life. You have to just, you, hey, I can look at the ugly nature. Yeah, you have I can to be look a at leader. the ugly nature. You have to be the change that you want to see out there. You have to be the representation of what you want to see. And if you lead and with love and compassion and empathy, and you're strong in that, people will follow that. I think that they're much more but holding people to that accountability yes. too. That this is not acceptable in yes. this environment, and we're in a very weird, oversensitive space on our planet where everybody's so worried about hurting each other's feelings, but then really they're not. Right? It's just I'm really worried about hurting your feelings as long as I could get in trouble for it. Right. Um, and that's that's just weird to me. I, I'm still baffled. In all honesty, I'm still baffled that in 2024 there's racism and sexism and ageism. You know, you look at the Back Golden the Girls TV show. Those women were 50s, yep, early 60s, and you look at them and you're like, my God, why don't the women I know look like that now? Well, it's the hairdos and the, the designer clothes and an and, and an attempt to try to look younger. So there's a difference, you know. It's in the perceptions that we put forth and what we want people to see us as. Um, so a lot of that is the mindset that we project out to people. And if you want people to see you as a creature and a beast, do creature and beastly things. If you want people to see the goodness inside you, you got to work a little harder to get through that gunk and let yourself shine so that you can be seen and, and lead people. And, you know, that's been the biggest takeaway for me. Sure, I would like to have become a millionaire doing what I do. But sometimes just reading through the emails that people have sent to me and the kindness that they've sent to me and the things that they've said of how this one sentence that I just incorporated in a talk resounded with them and it helped them make a positive change for their life. And they thank me for that. That hits me so much more. I mean, it doesn't pay my bills, but it sure makes me feel spiritually a lot better that that what I'm doing and, and the way I'm working is affecting and impacting people in a positive way. You know, going back to money, I feel like money has gotten completely out of control as well. I, I understand money is a tool. I understand we all need to do some sort of transactional stuff in order to get the things that we need in life. But I also believe that our, our, our culture has become about having money. It's become about being addicted to luxury and it's become about showing off what you have. And it, and it has become about allowing things that have no real value, material things, uh, let that fill you up, make you feel good rather than 
the things that actually matter. So you're actually just trying to fill up a void that will never be, uh, you'll never feel any, you'll never feel full if you're going to try and constantly right. fill up with things exterior wise, whether it be your. Cause that bucket's got a hole in it. It does. Yeah. It's got a big hole in it. And I think people are chasing the almighty dollar thinking, well, if I can be rich, I'm going to have, I'm going to be happy. I'm going to live the life that I want. And you might have a nicer car. You might have a nicer house, but I guarantee you, just like with everything in life, for instance, I'm an assistant director. I work on film and TV. And you would think that actors would just feel like they have it all. You know, they would just feel like they have it all because they do from the outside. They've got the looks. They've got the lifestyle, they've got admiration, they've got a lot of power. And I can't tell you how many actors I work with that you would be shocked at how miserable they are. And it's because they're trying to fill themselves up with something that is never going to satisfy them. And you get over money, you get over the power, you get over the admiration, and you're left with yourself. You're left with yourself regardless and the things that really matter, the things that bring you connection and love and uh, a deep uh, acknowledgement of your humanity do not come from money or power or where you live or what kind of car you drive. It just doesn't. And that is a lesson that I think humanity is going to really learn the hard way because we are heading into this world where you're either going to have money and have a, a normal, safe kind of fine life. Or you're not going to have money and you're going to be living in lack. You're going to be living in despair and you're going to be very, very angry at your situation. And it's a, it's a ticking time bomb. I feel like at at this moment, at this juncture with the money situation, I I just feel like we're in dangerous territory, kids. (laughs) We really are. We have been a long time that we we put the value on the wrong thing and money means nothing to anybody anymore except for those that don't have it. Uh, but even then, it's not the money, it's the what it can get you where it can take you. And I'm not dismissing that. That's an important, nobody wants to live in a slum. Nobody no. wants to have that life. And, and a lot of people are held back by their status. And, uh, you know, but there are a lot of people who started off the exact same way. I love biographies. I listen to autobiographies all the time from musicians and actors and comedians. And it's amazing to me how many of them were miserable, broke, but their life still became what they wanted because they just kept doing what it took to put themselves in, no matter how much time, no matter how much effort, no matter how much sweat equity, no matter how much depression and and disappointment they got. Okay, I learned from that. Let's step in again. What can we do? What's the next round? And and that's an important element that, again, a lot of people don't have because we're now in a, in a level of entitlement where a lot of people just want, because I'm here. What, what do you mean you don't see a value in me. Well, you've done nothing kind. You've done nothing to show me your value. All you've shown me is gimme, gimme, gimme. And then they wonder why they're not getting out of the the circumstances that they're in. And that goes for every race, color, creed, sexuality, and uh, financial status. If you lose track of that, you lose track of who you are and what's really important. And I mean, I know a lot of this sound very tree huggery and BS to people, but I'm here to tell you, you know, I mean, I have I face an inter- insurmountable uh, insurmountable wedge every month that I have to figure out a way to get over. And every month I figure out a way to get over it. And I can let it weigh down on me and slide in and crush me to death. Or I can say, okay, now what am I going to do next month to make sure that I don't, you know, that I make it, that I survive, that I get out of this and that I keep going. So it's it's who you are and what your determination is and what can I do to make sure that I can learn. And I'm still, like I said, I'm still learning how I can put all these things in play and make a a better place for me and my children. You know, I, I took being a parent very seriously. I fight anxiety and depression all the time. Suicide crosses my mind every week, but you know what is much more important to me that my kids realize that's not an out. Well, if dad did it. So to me, I took that as a very serious uh, legacy. My legacy is no matter how things get, no matter how bad they seem, no matter how much I want to quit, 
I can't do that. It's not my luxury anymore. I have people that that I cannot show that that that's an okay reason to do what you're going to do. We're going to face these things anyway, so let's just keep slugging through them. Figure out another way. Find another door to open, another window to close, and, and a way to keep moving forward. And I, I wish more people would grasp that concept. And it's not even the fatality of death being the the signal, but just to realize, hey, I've got this status in life and I have to I have to elevate myself. I have to keep moving forward because I do have people that watch me and depend on me. And what lesson in life do I want to send? Uh, do I want to send just quit or do I want to send this sucks? It hurts. I'm sad. But what do I got to do to get out of this? Right. And that I'm hoping is the bigger lesson for my children that will watch me struggle and maybe some of their step parents not. But the fact is, I never quit. No matter how much I wanted to, no matter how bad things got, I didn't quit. I just kept moving forward. So a lot of these things are a choice. And, uh, you know, and it doesn't mean that you're bad or broken or defective for having these thoughts, but I accept them for who they are and what they are, my, my thoughts. And, just realize to compartmentalize them. Okay, I can let this feeling hit right now. It sucks. I wish I wasn't here. And then I realize, no, I don't. I, I, I love my grandkids. I want to see them again tomorrow. I want to do this. I want to go there. I want to be here. And I don't want people around the world that have felt like, oh, Dave, you helped me out of this at the end, feel disappointed because I gave in. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's that to me. I hold that as a very important uh, legacy to who I am that I want people to feel that, you know, there's always a way to keep moving forward. And that's that's all we can do in our lives is hope that we can influence one or two people in that way. And, uh, you know, I got 11 kids uh, between my own and uh, through marriage that have been that are my children. And I, I just want to keep setting that example so that they keep moving forward and hopefully my grandkids move forward. And, you know, you just life is short. Enjoy every minute of it you possibly can. True story. Well said, sir. Well said. Well, we're coming up in an hour and I promised I wouldn't keep you any longer than that. Although I do feel like I could talk to you for a very long time, Dave. Like you are very interesting and it's refreshing to have a conversation like this with, with a man. Can I say that? I mean, you, you are not only um, super intelligent, but you are deeply empathetic and um, profoundly emotionally intelligent. And it is hard to find that in men these days. <laughs> no offense to the men out there. <laughs> oh, no. You know what? I mean, here's the thing is men get that. Uh, men, ha- all of us have that. Uh, some are just less willing to show the vulnerability. But like I said, what I've, I've realized my gift is that I can be that person and be weak in those moments and show that vulnerability. And it hasn't been a liability. I'm sure there are some people that are like, Oh God, that whiny piece of garbage. He's always talking about this or that or the other. But to the other people out there that are still sitting on the fence post and are having a rough day might realize, Hey, he made it through. I, I can make it through. And that to me is much more important than the naysayers. And like I said, there's even something to learn in the naysayers. When I got on TV and I had friends get TV shows, I said, "Uh, don't pay attention to the negativity. And they're like, oh, but there's, and I go, right. But the negative people tune in to watch you fail. They want you to fail. And you know what? That means they're watching. And that means they're bringing the ratings. So it's not just your fans that are going to love you. It's the people that hate you that are going to watch every move you make. So that's okay. Make sure that what they see and that the moves that you make mean something so that eventually you can erode them. And it might speak to their soul at some point that, you know, I, no matter what a jerk I was to that guy, he just kept moving and just kept, you know, I, I don't stop and kick back into the dirt with most people. On rare occasion, I will cross swords on social media with somebody, but it's more out of entertainment for myself that today I just feel like taking on a jackass and I'll, I'll play with them a little bit and show them, hopefully at the end of the conversation, just what a dummy you were for doing that. But a lot of times then what you don't see is I'll send them a private message that says, hey, listen, what we did today was stupid and it was it was fun. We both got to take pot shots at each other, but no lessons were learned here today. And now everybody just thinks this is the way we should move forward. I'm going to erase that and not because you got the better of me and not because I got the better of you, but more because 
uh, let's be better than those moments than we just shared. And I wish you nothing but love and success in your future. And it's okay that you can disagree with me and I'll disagree with you. But you know what? We'll both still wake up tomorrow and put our shoes on and put our clothes on and go to work and do what we have to do. And I think that a lot of times I reach more people by extending that olive branch than I do by just being cruel. There's no, there's no good in that, but we have to stop punishing each other for being open. Yeah. Uh, stop making men feel bad for being weak. Stop making men feel bad for being empathetic. Stop making men feel bad for showing emotions. And the same with women. Gotta, everybody's just got to start treating each other with kindness and compassion and love and, and understanding. And it doesn't mean you have to accept everything about them. But it doesn't mean that it's also your duty to be an asshole and point out how, what a failure they are or how you wouldn't do it that way. Nobody asked you. Nobody asked you to listen to this show and then write to me and tell me what a, a weak piece of male garbage I have and how embarrassed I should be and my children will probably be screwed up. I've gotten emails like that at the end of a, 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 an interview. And my thought is always, man, I really feel for you. You're in a lot of pain exactly. and you're lashing out. And may God just find your soul and your heart and find a way to bring light into you because- this is no way to live and, and walk away. I just don't care if people think I'm weak or sad or empathetic anymore. I'd rather that the people that need to hear the message got the message. And maybe in the future, you'll see that message too. Just like when you're raising your kids and you say, I hope you have a kid just like you. You don't mean that in a, in a bad way, but you mean it so that at some point your kid goes, oh, this is why dad did Now that. I get it. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I get it. Yeah. I get it. Yeah. It's all part of the tr- all part of the journey. And one other thing I'll leave you with is you talked about fear. We can all walk in a place of fear. One of the most beautiful lessons I ever learned about fear. I was a uh, a volunteer at Mark Lund Children's Home in Roselle, Bloomingdale, Illinois. I can't remember which town specifically, uh, but I was a volunteer there. And on the First or second week I was there, they brought me in to meet this little boy, Jude. And they're like, oh, Jude needs somebody to do some reading time and and tactile time where you help him play with games and stuff. And I walked in and there is this cage, for lack of a better term. It was his crib, but it was metal slats with a glass bubble over it, right? And inside was this tortured looking, twisted faced creature that's how I saw him when I first saw this. And I, my heart was like, oh, Jesus, that thing's terrifying. And his mouth was off to the side and he didn't have all of his teeth and, you know, crooked eyes. He was just terrifying to me as a teenage boy. And they said, Jude, this is Dave. Dave's here to play with you today. And Jude just kind of looked up at me and just this face looked like every kind of horror creature you could imagine from a horror movie. And she goes, put your hand in and shake shake Jude's hand. And I fought every urge to just keep my hand back and be like, no, thanks. So I slid my hand into there and Jude grabbed my hand and just stroked it against his cheek. And this beautiful smile broke out on his face. And I realized that the perception of fear was shattered in a moment because I realized that looking at this little being, judging him for something he's not in control of, could have robbed me of a beautiful moment. And going forward, Jude became one of my favorite humans on the planet. And we had so much fun and he would sing, Hey Jude to me and the Winnie the Pooh theme. And the, and although I couldn't always understand the words, I could pick up the rhythm and meter of what he was doing and saying. And we had just a delightful time. And I, I think to myself, had I allowed myself to live behind that wall of fear, A, I would have hurt him. And B, I would have disappointed myself because I wouldn't have got to see what a remarkable little creature this little boy was. And he went from being, you know, the beast to the beauty. Yeah. And I realized the real beast was me in having that fear without knowing. So fear is false evidence that appears real. And you have to get past that and look for the reality of the moment. Yeah. And sometimes what seems the most appalling and, and heartbreaking to us is the moment we need to step up and do the right thing. Because that little boy needed me as much as I needed him. Yes. I love that. I love that. It's a great lesson. Fear just holds us back from so many things in life. And if we Mm -hmm. can really be more conscious of that alone, that can make a huge impact. Um, Mm -hmm. 
Dave, I feel like I want to have you back on. There's so many things that we did not get to that I would have loved to talk to, but you're a busy man. You have a lot going on. And uh, I promise I'd only keep you an hour, but Dave Schrader, everybody, I'm very excited to have him. We're going to end it there. Um, Dave, please, I'll be back. please come back. I'd love to have you again. You we didn't get to talk about so many things. Let's do it again. Ladies and gentlemen, Dave Schrader, the one and only. Check his show out on YouTube, The Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. Do it now. Thank you, everybody. And we will see you next week on Faith from Atheism to Enlightenment. Journey well, everybody. And that is a wrap on Episode 9, Paranormal Perspectives with Dave Schrader. I hope you guys enjoyed the show. I will say this. I apologize for the sound on my end. It was not great. Dave sounded beautiful. I sounded not my best. My mic was too far away from my face. I didn't sound amazing. I apologize. I'm going to do better. Moving forward. Here we go. Um, the other thing I will say is I was so pleasantly surprised at our discussion when I was going to have him on. I really thought it was going to be more spooky, alien, paranormal, fun. And instead, it turned out to be profoundly deep and authentic and real discussion about not only humanity and consciousness, but even his own most impactful experiences and how thoughtful he is. I just loved our chat. I hope to have him back on again. Please check out his show on YouTube called The Paranormal 60 with Dave Schrader. He does get super speaky, spooky and alien and paranormal on his show. It's fun. It's, it's fantastic. I enjoy watching him. You will too, I promise. Now, next week on Fate from Atheism to Enlightenment, I will be bringing you Kimberly Meredith. Kimberly had a near-death experience about nine years ago. She died. She came back with the ability to heal. And she comes on the show and tells me all about it. She is a psychic healer, an empath. She has a book out. It is called Awakening to the Fifth Dimension, Discovering the Soul's Path to Healing. We talk about it. It's a very interesting discussion. I hope you tune into that. That is going to be next week. If you want to follow me on Instagram, I am at F period, A period, T period, E period podcast. Go ahead and follow the show. I'll give you weekly updates as to what's coming up next. Support the show. Follow me. I'd love to have you on board. If you want to see me on YouTube, I do have a, a YouTube channel. It's called at fate channel. You can see me talking to all my guests. It's a lot of fun. Subscribe, tell a friend. I'd love to keep this going. Until next week, guys, welcome to your fate, everyone. I'll see you next week. Journey well. Bye.